Hello, this is Odin Hadas from Tracepan Communications, and today's video will be about technologies for 10G PON. Uh, this is beyond G PON because G PON is 2.5G. So let's begin. Before we get into the details, let's look at a slide which was created about 10 years ago and try to give to illustrate the future of pod technologies. At that time, GPON and 1G EPON were relevant technology. They were already available and deployed. XGPON1 at that time was being standardized, where XGPON1 was 2.5G up and 10G down. And there were also some, um, some plans to standardize 10G by 10G under XGPON. Uh, then there were some other directions, WDM PON, NG PON 1, including long reach. And this was perceived as, I would say, the next step. And then they were thinking about steps beyond this, which were NG PON 2 with different directions, such as combination of TDM, DWDM, CDM, OFDM, and various other ideas. Now, uh, if you want to take the main ideas from this slide and see how uh, they were planning to expand GPON, there were three main directions which gave an expansion. An expansion is actually in several aspects. It's more throughput, more customers, and maybe security and things like that. But let's talk about the main aspects. So one idea was expanding expansion of the TDMM a PON technologies, something similar to GPON, but higher rates and higher power budgets, which enable higher split ratios, meaning more customers. The second idea was WDM PON. WDM PON actually means you take different, you take a PON technology, a PON topology, but each customer has his own channel, his own wavelength. So this way you can provide higher rates to every customer because that customer has separate wavelengths. The advantages is, or the advantages are simplified Mac layer, higher bandwidth per customer, and independency among customers because each one has his own his own uh, wavelength. So, in terms of protocols, in terms of Mac layer, they're independent. You don't need to split resources among the different ONUs. Uh, the main challenges are the high cost of the optical components because they need to support very uh, it's a very discreet, very accurate weather And they're also sensitive to temperature changes because as temperatures change, there may be drifts in the channels that they transmit and receive. And this may cause them to, to collide with other uh, elements on the pond. Then there was TWDM, which is a combination of the two. It means you have several separate TDMA ponds that share the same fiber. Each uses a different wavelength. So, and this is actually what happens with ng 2 but this is a separate video that you can watch. So let's start with xg one xg one was the obvious main step after g -Pon. It was based on similar principles. The downstream rate was 10G, or to be more accurate, 9.95328. Uh, the upstream was 2.5G. Um, and this is compared to 2.5G in GPON and 1.25G up in GPON. Other major enhancements, 29 dB optical budget, uh, where in GPON it's 28, split ratio of 1 to 256, in GPON it's 128. Uh, some power saving modes and enhanced security. As an example, encryption, not only in the downstream as in GPON, but optionally also in the upstream and some other security modes, uh, including a pre-shared key, and so on. I will not get into these details right now. In terms of framing a TDMA control, it made reuse and adaptation of the GBON protocol. So the principles were very similar to those of GBON. Uh, some enhancements are a more flex flexible flow channel, so there can be multiple messages in the same frame, while in GBON it's only one. And the flow message was extended, the length was extended to 48 bytes compared to 13 in GPON. This gives you more options. 
uh, the data unit of four bytes instead of one, and some fields were expanded to give more options. This is an example of how uh, one of the frames is parsed by a trace pad analyzer. Uh, this is an XG.1 or XGS pawn frame. As you can see, there are two plow messages in each frame. Now, this is not in every frame, but in this specific frame, you can see that there's one called first profile and the second called request registration. This is another example where we're showing the details of one of the plow messages. This is the raw data, the hex bytes, and as you can see, four times 10 plus eight, this is 48 bytes. So this is the 48 byte plow compared to 13 bytes of GPON. XGSPON. XGSPON is quite similar to GPON. I'll talk about the history of how XGSPON was born in one of our next slides. Uh, the main differences is that XGSPON is symmetrical. It's 10G down and up, but the upstream also supports XGPON 1 ON use, which means upstream can only can also be 2.5G. So it supports two types of ON use on the same pawn. Each ONU will either be 10 or 2.5, uh, and the OLT supports both. The protocol and frame structure are very similar to XGPON 1, but there are some minor differences. Uh, it's compatible with XGPON 1, which makes it possible to connect XGPON 1 ONUs to XGSPON OLTs. In terms of the wavelength assignment, if you go back to history, GPON has 1310 upstream, 1490 downstream. 1550 was also reserved in GPON for the analog RF overlay. This is the, the channel which is used for delivering analog TV mostly. <coughs> XGPON 1 and XGSPON use the same wavelengths, 1270 in the upstream and 1577 in the downstream. Uh, and then there are ranges of wavelengths which are reserved for NG.2. Again, we have a separate video on NG.2, which explains how this range of wavelengths is used. So I will not get to, into this now. A little bit about the history. As uh, we said, XG.1 was the obvious next step after G.1. Uh, but many of the service providers and as well as the vendors felt that the leap is not big enough. It was four times as much as GPON in the downstream, two times as much in the upstream, and everybody felt that there must be something bigger to justify going to a different technology. In 2012, uh, after XGPON 1 was standardized in 2011, in 2012, FSUN agreed about the architecture for XGPON 2, which was actually, the, which was actually based on TWDF on for XG.1 or similar to XG.1 systems running on the same fiber infrastructure with different wavelengths. Uh, now, this took time until this was standardized and standardization only came, the standard was ratified three years later in 2015. Um, now, industry has been waiting for XG.2 to mature and to be standardized, but due to various factors, which again, we'll talk about in our other video, um, it really didn't become a deployable technology, at least to most of the service providers. So the industry was waiting for something which can be deployed in the short term. And this is how XGS Pond was born. So the idea was, let's take the protocol and the frame structure of NG Pond 2, remove the wavelength the different wavelengths and the wavelength tuning mechanisms and stick with a pro a simple protocol which in the future can be got can be expanded back to ng.2 but right now we'll use only one wavelength so this is xgs so actually historically xgs came after ng.2 in terms of deployment it got much more traction and is much more widely deployed today Regarding the next steps, ITU and IEEE are already exploring ideas for new pawn technologies 
beyond XGS Pond and NG Pond 2. Uh, they are looking at 25G and even 50G over Pond with a single wavelength. Some vendors have already announced prototypes, which of course are pre-standardized because there's no standard. The main driver for this for these throughput rates are the backhaul for the 5G wireless networks. In terms of the opportunities and challenges for service providers, as we said, NG.2 took long to develop. The architecture was defined in 2012. The standard was ratified only in 2015. And as of 2019, the cost of optics is still high and it is delaying mass deployment. Again, uh, various factors causing the optics to be expensive. Again, in our video about NG.2. So for several years, service providers had to choose between proceed with XG.1 or wait for NG.2 to mature and in the meantime, use G.1. And then once XGS.1 was born or was standardized, they had a solution for this. So as of today, if you look at North America, Europe, and Asia, in North America, some of the service providers are moving on with XGS bond. Uh, actually, the majority of the large service providers are already doing at least some testing, some have final deployments. Only one, uh, Verizon, is the one that has announced that it's going for NG bond 2. In Europe, many of the service providers still use G bond. Uh, Europe was relatively late to adopt one technologies. But we are seeing adoption of XGS Pond. It's beginning to happen. In Asia, both XGS Pond and XG.1 are being adopted. And now it depends where you look in Asia. There are some countries that still use EPON and 10G EPON. China is giving priority to XG.1. Most other countries are giving priority to XGS Pond, at least worldwide. Uh, this is it for this video. And if you want to learn more, you're welcome to watch our, vivid, our webinars on our website. Go to www.tracepan.com category webinars. Uh, we have a variety of webinars with more details about these technologies and others. If you want to learn more about our company, go to our website, www.tracepan.com, and you may contact us on info at tracepan.com. Um, if you like this video, give us a like. You're also welcome to subscribe to our channel. And that's all for today. Thank you.